It is my happy job to welcome each of you to this, the sixth annual UCL Baker McKenzie International Law and Litigation Lecture. Now, it seems to me that our firm's sponsorship of this event is entirely suitable given the global nature of our business and the fact that international law is at the very heart of what we do. This is particularly the case in relation to our dispute resolution practice. And it is important that as a firm, we support important knowledge sharing events like tonight's lecture. We in the profession all must understand and appreciate the laws that bind us together in an ever increasingly uncertain world, particularly so when we cross borders. It is why, in my opinion, events like this lecture are so important. 2016 is not over yet, but it has certainly given rise to great change. A new word, Brexit, has given rise to a new political reality that is shaping and will shape for some time to come the legal and business firmament for those of us who practice in this jurisdiction. <clears throat> As if Brexit was not enough for one year, my countrymen in the US, competitive as ever, seemingly decided they really must top this uh, Brexit phenomena with Brexit plus plus and elect a man as president whose only consistency is his inconsistency. But if we are to track the growing number of hits or rank name recognition any one organization has experienced in 2016, surely the World Trade Organization must be up there. Its profile is definitely on the rise as a result of Brexit and Trump. I've even heard the three letters WTO cross the lips of my 11-year-old son after hearing it mentioned so often on the Today program. Under the umbrella of Brexit, what will it be? Hard, soft, based on WTO, who knows? It's all just part of morning coffee discussions these days. And come 20th of January, it looks as though the WTO may even take more, take on more relevance and prominence if Mr. Trump takes some of the steps he has promised to take. They have already noted that his plans would be, quote, destructive. Let's just collectively conclude that it is another reason why this evening's lecture is so topical. I am very much looking forward to hearing what Judge Yang has to say in her lecture. But before we get to the main act, I would like to introduce our proper host. There are many individuals in this room who could give Mr. Trump and uh, and plenty of his advisors some much needed advice. I personally would start by introducing him to my barber, but I suspect that Professor Philippe Sands would have much more erudite and important counsel. Philippe is an English barrister at Matrix Chambers and Professor of Laws and Director of the Center on International Courts and Tribunals at University College London. He appears as counsel and advocate before many international courts and tribunals including the ICJ, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, and the International Criminal Court. He's also on the panel of arbitrators at ICSID and the Court of Arbitration for Sport. He is the author of 16, yes, you heard correctly, 16 books on international law, including Lawless World and Torture Team. His latest book, East West Street, on the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity, was awarded the 2016 Bailey Gifford Prize. We at Baker McKenzie are delighted to partner with Philippe and UCL for this annual event. And without further ado, I would like to hand over to Philippe to introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, don't, I don't need it. Thank you very much, and my thanks, my warm thanks to Baker McKenzie for making this series possible. It's a real privilege for us at UCL uh, to work with you, and I join in warmly welcoming uh, everyone uh, this evening, friends and colleagues and students and others. Uh, I'm really excited about this evening's uh, lecture and lecturer. Uh, I met Judge Zhang about a year ago, we were both attending a conference together at the European University uh, Institute uh, on uh, the WTO, I think at 20 was the subject, and we happened to be staying uh, in the same hotel. Uh, and the next morning, we sat together over breakfast, and it was a joy and a revelation to talk with you. We had a very long 
and very open conversation about international law, about international courts and tribunals. And I found this evening's lecturer to be extraordinarily acute, extraordinarily robust, and extraordinarily entertaining. It was a fantastic breakfast. And I came back and I got in touch with Ed and I said, I think you really have to invite Judge Zhang to give this lecture. And we are so very thrilled uh, that you are here. I came to know Judge Zhang a year ago as a member of the World Trade Organization appellate body, China's first member uh, of the uh, appellate uh, body. But what I had not fully appreciated until uh, this evening as we sat and talked in preparation is a truly remarkable career that precedes that appointment from which Dr. Zhang has recently uh, stepped down. And if I just give you some of the highlights, you'll get a sense of the depth of experience she brings to the subject she's going to address tonight uh, and its breadth in terms of truly, I think, being probably the Chinese lawyer who has been at the heart of the most significant developments in terms of China's engagement in the world of trade and investment uh, and uh, commerce. Uh, Jia Zhang was educated at a number of universities, Beijing, Sorbonne, where she happened to be when the Cultural Revolution took place in China in the mid-1960s, uh, and then uh, Georgetown. Uh, she subsequently worked uh, for the Chinese Ministry uh, of Trade. She was the Director General of the Department of Treaty and Law, and she was General Counsel uh, for that body. Uh, in the course of which experience, as she told me this evening, she negotiated over 40 BITs for China, which immediately opens the world uh, of uh, investment. She became the, she worked then for the Asian Development Bank, became general counsel uh, of the Asian Development Bank, uh, and then became executive director of the West African Development Bank. In all of these cases, a Chinese uh, first, uh, and then was appointed as the first Chinese member uh, of the WTO appellate body. When I said to you, Judge Zhang, did you bring any judicial experience to that role? You said, of course I did. And I said, what? And she said, well, I've sat as arbitrator in over a hundred cases. So we are really in the presence of someone we're very fortunate indeed to hear um, from a, a perspective that is different from the London perspective on what international law is, what international litigation is, what the WTO is, as was mentioned, at an absolutely crucial moment where that organization appears to be thrust at the center of so many issues in this country, in the United States, and for many countries of the world. So uh, without further ado, uh, we will hear a lecture, and we will then uh, have an opportunity for questions. Judge Yang has said she very much encourages uh, questions on a range of issues related to this topic. We are hugely grateful to have you, and I invite everyone to warmly, warmly welcome you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I need to ask. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. And thank you for inviting me to come to the one of the world's uh, biggest leading universities, particularly in London, is the biggest university. I have learned that this UCL was the first university to accept the goals, so the gender issue already was settled long, long time ago. Congratulations. And I would like to also thank the uh, partners from uh, Beck McKinsey that I know well. You have uh, the worldwide uh, uh, offices. So, uh, and thank you all for coming here. Uh, when you mention my uh, CV, it means that I'm very old. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, uh, you are the future. I just read your 20 years strategy with missions and uh, visions. 
uh, with certainly with aspirations, uh, education will make you the future of the world. So I'm so happy to have a direct dialogue with you, not a, a formal seminar. With regard to the achievement of the WTO dispute settlement, you know the WTO dispute settlement has mainly four functions. One is the multilateral negotiation form. They have already, there are eight rounds multilateral negotiations, but the latest one, Doha round, you know, with some problem, you know. And the second function is the foreign trade regime review system to review every member's government's their foreign trade system and measures. And third function is the dispute settlement, which is very important. The last one is technical cooperation. The most successful one is the dispute settlement. Why is it highly regarded as uh, the juror in the crown of the WTO? Because first, you can see with regard to the figures, in 20 years, WTO has settled more than 500 cases. So almost double than the number of GATT, G-A-T-T, in the last 50 years. And the secondly, it shows the number of cases, it shows the trust and confidence placed by the member governments on the WTO dispute settlement. And the second achievement is the, the average time for closing a case is between one year and two year and a half. For the most difficult one, yet it takes longer. The third point I would say you can see the enforcement of the WTO dispute settlement the decisions is quite good because uh, almost 99% of the cases, the decisions enforce. You may, may be argue that because the WTO is a prospective system, they just ask a member government a losing party to withdraw their measure, which is inconsistent with the WTO covered agreement, or modify the measure, or abolish the measure. So they don't ask for retrospective monetary compensation. So in that sense, it's easier for the losing party to implement the decision. The most important thing, because of the WTO system is a, a mandatory, one single undertaking. If you agree with all the provisions, 60, about 1,000 pages agreements, if you agree with it, you take it. Otherwise, if no reservation could be made. Unlike GATT system. GATT system in the past, they do have a grandfather clause. It means that you can still maintain your old system or certain kind of exceptions, reservations. But with the, the WTO system, it's one single undertaking. It's mandatory including the dispute settlement. So that's why for all dispute settlement, if one party requests for consultation and the other party should accept sympathetic consideration means you cannot refuse. That's the system. 
And the most important, I feel that is successful because they have the system to supervise the updates, the, the enforcement. They have at least once per month, sometimes twice per month, DSP meetings. All 164 member governments, they send their representatives. The, the room is larger than this one. And they listen to the losing party, how they implement the decision. So just like a list, or not to say black name, but at least if you do not enforce, you, you do not implement, you lose face in front of the, the, the other 163 members. So this system is, uh, is very helpful to achieve the enforcement uh, issue. Uh, procedurally, why I see that uh, they are pretty successful. Uh, first, the decision-making process is very fast, almost uh, automatic. In the past, in Gets' time, is uh, to for the establishment of a panel or adoption of a panel report, they need to have. Uh, a consensus. Everybody did agree, but it's very difficult. The losing party or eventually possible potential losing party will not agree for the establishment of the panel. So now they reverse during the Eurogroup round from a positive consensus into negative consensus. It means if you ask to stop the establishment, to stop the adoption of the panel, you have to get everybody agreed. It's impossible. So that's why making the system almost automatic. Our reports never modified by the DSP meeting, even formally requirement is, uh, uh, should be adopted by the DSP, but they never modify one word of the report. The second important achievement is the establishment of the appellate body. The appellate body is the highest adjudicative body of the WTO dispute system. The appellate body is composed by seven judges. They should be worldwide re recognized lawyers, experts in trade, in the covenant agreement, and in law. They should also have geographic representation. The composition, composition of the appellate body, seven members from different regions, from different backgrounds of legal system or legal education, is very interesting, very important. It's some kind of internal checks and balance. If they have different views, and to avoid one-sided views for the interpretation. Uh, so that one term is four years, and then renewable for two terms, eight years. So I serve for the maximum two terms for eight years. Uh, some of my colleagues, they served for four years. Uh, so that, that's the system works. The official language of the WTO is English, French, and Spanish. Fortunately, I speak, je parle français et anglais. So, uh, the advantage of foreign languages is very helpful. And the most important is the rule of reasoning. To give a persuasive report, decision, 
is very important. And also, the procedure is very clear. It's transparent. And it's, uh, sometimes if parties agree, the oral hearings can be also open to the public. And the procedures, due process, is very important. We, a division, for a case, three judges form a division. The division is uh, responsible for the final conclusion of the case. However, for every case, we need to have uh, all seven judges to come to Geneva and to exchange of views. So in the reality, we have to read all the reports, submissions. Now the, that's the problem. It's, uh, uh, because it, frequent traveling and also very lengthy submissions and reports, you have to read words by words. So very difficult, very challenging. So the, the overall, the WTO dispute settlement uh, uh, system is uh, highly appreciated by the world community. And the reports also published in the WTO website. The case studies in many universities, they do use the our reports. On some of the recent IGC cases, they also refer some of our uh, rulings. So it means that it's the world community, they highly appreciate also the professionalism of the WTO dispute setting. And also, the wide and active participation by members. Because not only developed countries use the system, now more and more developing countries or smaller countries, they do participate in the dispute settlement of the WTO to provide equal opportunities for the access to justice. I think it's very important. Now, I want to say a few words regarding the challenges we are facing. First, uh, the DSU, the Dispute Settlement Understanding, have some uh, uh, provisions not so clear they need to be fixed as soon as possible, such as the transparency issue, or hearings should be open to the public, and the power of remand, because now the appellate body has no power to return back the cases to the, the lower level. And we do also have a problem with the, the, the time requirement for the appellate body to complete its report within 90 days. The 90 days include also holidays, weekends, translation, the real working time only two months. So, in fact, you know, the number of uh, cases is increasing. Currently, on the pipeline, <clears throat> about more than 20 cases ending. And also, the complexity of the legal issues. You know, the WTO has enlarged it's the scope of a jurisdiction, because they cover not only trade in goods, but also trade in services, trade-related intellectual property, 
trade-related invest investment measures, and the TBT, SPS, agriculture uh, products. So you will see they cover a wide range of uh, goods and uh, trade. So in many new issues, for instance, the key issue to compare national treatment is black product. For trade in goods, to see like products, because the WTO has already accumulated, already a lengthened criteria. For instance, consumers, uh, you know, their appreciation, the, their, their uh, perception, or the end use of the product, and the physical characteristics of the product. The final is the tariff classification of a product to define whether they are lack or not lack. Now the new issue is whether with trade in services, lack product also to be defined this way. So many new issues. Uh, race. Then we are facing a problem. Is the submissions and the reports are getting longer and longer. Uh, very often when I travel, half of my suitcase with the papers, very heavy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sometimes the, the, the government officials, they need lawyers. And for legal services, they want to show their services, produce very lengthy submissions. But uh, on the one hand, we have uh, the complexity of the cases, the number, the, the increase uh, of cases. But uh, on the other hand, we have uh, also heavy workload. But our time is very limited. So I think uh, it's not sustainable. So in my farewell uh, speech, I made a 10 points proposal to change the situation. Uh, you may already know that, but I want to explain the reason behind that, why I made this, those proposals for the, the, the reform. Uh, I think first, because I see the current uh, appeal rate uh, still very high, and the number of disputes is increasing. Some disputes, if they go through the formal procedures, then it would take longer time. To me, I see some of the cases, it's not purely law or purely trade issue. It's some mixture between legal issue and economic issue and trade issue. So if you ask the judges to give uh, a full legal reasoning, you spend more time, but the outcome is quite limited. So that's why my first proposal is to, the WTO should explore the possibility of more use of informal resolution of governmental trade disputes. For example, through consultation, mediation, and conciliation, also called Alternative Dispute Settlement, ADR. I, I'm sure that you are all familiar with this ADR. In the world, if we see in China, the United States, in the UK, 
particularly in the countryside, they are very often used ADR, conciliation, by some very knowledgeable or high reputation people to settle their family or neighborhood dispute instead of going to the court. So I would say because WTO's jurisdiction is dealing with government to government, and the government measures are all published, so you know the, you, the measure. And the WTO has a bunch of uh, com comprehensive uh, rules to follow. So if you use, encourage government to government through consultation for some small, smaller uh, countries, if they need a third person as a mediator to show the, the problem, to, show, to, to explain the legal consequences of their measure, it's very easy to settle their dispute. The most important is through the ADR to avoid or to reduce the confrontation or conflict between two governments and to let the trade going on. Because once they go to, through the formal adjudicative proceedings, then companies trade, they will immediately affect it. So they are waiting for the outcome of the decision. If through consultation ADR, if they settle the dispute, in two weeks, for instance, two rounds of consultation, then they can help their companies to continue their long-term trading relationship. With the ADR, the problem is uh, people will ask, why they come to the WTO? Because the WTO can issue a bending resolution decision if the losing party does not change its measure and the winning party can bring, can ask the WTO to have to adopt their uh, trade sanctions, to withdraw their trade uh, tariff uh, preferential treatment, for instance. I would think that uh, since the, the panel report and the appellate body reports should be adopted by the DSB, giving legal effect, and the same thing, if a party, a party to another party, they get uh, their, the solution of their dispute through ADR, and then their uh, agreement should be also adopted by the D DSB, but at the condition that their two parties' resolution will not affect interest and the rights of a third party. Then they can also enforce their ADR outcome. They have the same legal bending effect. My second uh, proposal is if uh, consultations fail, the next step in the WTO is panel stage. So panel is very important in the whole dispute settlement system. But not the current situation is all the panelists are on ad hoc basis. Sometimes they do not have time to read the submissions, or they, are, they do not uh, have uh, a systemic uh, training or experience to dealing with the, the important cases. Because they are responsible for both facts findings and the legal reasonings. 
if they do not have enough knowledge about the covered agreement, it's very difficult to give a legal reasoning. So the facts, the, the, the panel stage, I do propose that they should give an ongoing training to all panelists, even they are they serve on ad hoc basis. So to enhance the quality and competency of the uh, panelists, it's very important to improve the quality of the panel report. Uh, my third proposal is to address the current shortage of capable staff. You know, for my, my last eight years service, I saw about seven high-level senior lawyers left the appellate body secretary offices because they want to go to law firms. So the salary or the remuneration much higher than the WTO. Meantime, they can also re receive the WTO, for instance, pension or retirement and so on. Now the question is to keep those capable lawyers in the institution very important because not only the quality of the reports, the procedures, but also to maintain the institutional memories. Otherwise, always brand new people, you have to retrain them again. And also, I would think that they should encourage the mobility of uh, uh, the internal staff. Uh, and currently, they need to recruit uh, very talented lawyers from you know, all members uh, of the world. Particularly the percentage of staff from developing countries or new members, not enough. So they, they, they need to start that. The fourth point is the competent authority and committee of the WTO should clarify and interpret the, the WTO covered agreement in a timely manner. Because the highest authority of the WTO is the ministerial, trade ministerial conference. But they never made a formal interpretation of the covered agreement, at least during my last eight years service. So they should do that. Uh, to clarify or to make a formal interpretation of the, the WTO law. <clears throat> With regard to the, the power of remand, I would think that it's not, it's not the physical, or at least uh, uh, even the appellate body members are given such power to return back the case to the lower level. First, time consuming to establish a new panel. Secondly, if a party, particularly the potential losing party, they know, they know already the outcome of the, the appellate body decision, they are reluctant to provide additional information to justify their violation. So it doesn't work this way. My proposal is uh, we don't need to, to introduce a new power of remand, but rather to ask the panel at panel stage to, make, uh, to do a good job, to make a solid facts findings, to ask all parties to give uh, all factual information and evidence and they should sign a statement of facts. So in that case, if they bring their case to the appellate body, we reverse some of the panel's findings, and then we can still rely on the undisputed facts to make a final decision. 
Now I feel very sorry uh, to see that after spending already one year or two years efforts, and because there's no sufficient facts to support our new decision, so we leave it open, mooty. That's, I think, we should avoid. We, not to ask for power of remand, but rather ask the panel to do a very solid facts funding. We can solve this problem. In fact, I have personal experience with some of the cases. If we do extra efforts, we can complete legal analysis without you know, leaving the, the, the case open. So that, and my, my another uh, proposal is, since the submission is very long, I don't know how about the practice in the law firms here. Uh, we need to uh, set a page limit for submissions or for panel reports. Uh, because otherwise it's time consuming and the also parties, uh, they get confused because the report is too long, submission is too long, so they, they cannot grasp the, the essence of the issues. So I, I think that to write a short, convincing, clear, concise report is more difficult than a lengthened report. Because uh, with the, the, the modern technology, you just copy and paste, uh, copy and paste, making it very long, but uh, they cannot uh, you know, serve to have a prompt and a positive solution of disputes. I always say that our job, our mandate, is to have uh, to give uh, a positive solution of dispute, not to make a presentation. So that that, that one, I see that uh, the member government is very helpful with this proposal. I hope that uh, in the near future they can introduce some measures to to improve this. The eighth point is. Uh, the 90 days. Really, I would think that uh, it doesn't work. Because uh, some of the cases, if the appellate body is given more time, then we can, you know, the, the, the reports can be more persuasive and uh, concise. Because sometimes uh, they said that the readers cannot understand. It's too long, too complicated. So I think the 90 days, uh, uh, the requirement should be changed. The ninth, I think, uh, for governmental measures, now many of the WTO agreements, they do allow the governments to take, uh, have the rights to regulate trade particularly for public uh, uh, interest. For instance, a subsidy. There are good subsidies, there are bad subsidies. So, I would think you know the current uh, Article 8 of the SCM agreement, subsidy agreement, is uh, still pending. I do think that they should reactivate this article. What's Article 8 uh, talked about? It's uh, support, financial support to research activities, to the re remote regions, poor regions, so and also to the new uh, facilities needed to cope with the environmental protection 
requirement by law. So those, I think that they should uh, let those subsidy be become legal. But uh, that one it will take time for this. Uh, the last one, I would think that uh, the WTO system, the negotiation, decision making is very slow. Uh, unlike the dispute settlement. The dispute settlement is a negative consensus. But the WTO negotiations process is consensus. Consensus by 164 members is very, very difficult. So I think the process, they should uh, improve. And the WTO should be more active dealing with the, the, the free trade agreement. Because the, the multilateral trade agreement, like Doha uh, talk, is very, unfortunately, they, they cannot uh, get a positive result. They, they start from other issues, like trade facilitation or others. But meanwhile, there are about 400 free trade regional free trade agreements. So the WTO should do more to coordinate those regional agreements or to provide assistance to those uh, weaker or smaller nations to enhance their negotiations capability or bargaining power, uh, and also to, in, to give them legal advice to avoid any potential conflict between the FDA, FDA and the, the WTO. Okay, so that's, I, I see that my time is up. So I would like to, to close my remarks on the uh, achievement and uh, challenges. But the, I'm still confident the, the multilateral trading system has uh, plenty vigor. Uh, the WTO will never die. So that's my conclusion. Uh, that is very helpful to be very resistant against uh, protectionism, and also, particularly at the time of the world financial crisis, or downturn, economic downturn. So I think to enhance the standard of living of people and to reduce poverty is still our common mission. So now I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge Zhang. I, I think we'll go straight over to the audience, but I do just want to take advantage of your presence just to ask one thing. You, you, you um, are in a very interesting position uh, as the first Chinese member uh, of the WTO appellate body and as an individual who has probably unparalleled experience of China's involvement in this emerging system of international litigation. You talk, I know from my experience, WTO, China is very active now in participating in WTO dispute settlement. I know from my own experience, you, you very gently chided me uh, in relation to an award in ICSID uh, in which I sat as an arbitrator, part of a unanimous decision, declining jurisdiction uh, in the first ICSID case in which a Chinese investor uh, brought a claim. Um, and that is an area in which China is increasingly active on international dispute settlement. Can you, are you able to share with us your own personal, personal observations of what China's role is likely to be going forward on the settlement of international disputes uh, across a range of different issues? Because historically, China avoided dispute settlement by judges. And there now seems to be, at least in certain areas, a change taking place. And your comments now appear to be consistent with that change. But I wonder if you can say a little something personal 
about that? Okay, with regard to the China's participation in the WTO dispute settlement, they started as a third party to join, to observe the, the dis dispute settlement proceedings and to be familiar with the covenant agreements. Uh, that, as uh, you all know, that uh, as uh, Asian people, uh, China's tradition is uh, not to advocate the people or to go to the courts. They want to settle their dispute quietly. Uh, they don't want to lose face, for instance. Now it's changing. So at all levels, of course, uh, many cases, yeah, internally. So people get used to the, leg uh, the legal rules to protect their own rights. I think that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. And the, the rule of law is at particularly the judicial reform in China. Transparency. They are doing even better than the WTO. They, they open all their hearings to the public. Uh, with regard to international uh, disputes, with, to, for investor, between in, an investor and the, the host government, China both as uh, uh, to attract the foreign investment or, and also to have their companies to invest outside. They need to have such a system to protect the legal rights of their companies and also to attract the foreign investors you do need also to have the system in place to provide to confidence uh, of foreign investors to trust you, the, 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 the system. Uh, I'm, I'm quite confident that uh, in terms of a rule of law, uh, in the past 30 years, uh, since the opening door policy, a tremendous change introduced. First, they have a comprehensive legal system from the constitution, the civil law, criminal law, and to some, like foreign trade law, Oh, their, their uh, for instance, anti-dumping or anti-subsidy regulations as comprehensive as uh, the U.S. and the EU. Myself, uh, 20 years ago, I led a, a, a group of experts to come to Europe uh, to, you know, to discuss how to prepare our own anti-dumping regulations. Now it's working, it's working well. So I, I would I appreciate very, very much the openness now uh, of China. So the, their active participation in the WTO dispute settlement, particularly their enforcement of the WTO decisions, is the best. So highly appreciate including, maybe you know the case, for the copyright of China. They modify Article 4 of their copyright in order to meet the enforcement of the decision of the WTO. I don't see other uh, developed countries can do that. So I, I really, it's not only from myself, but also from my other colleagues, they, they also had a question. So I'm confident. Let's throw up because there's one question over here and then the lady back. Let's take both questions so we get a, a few more questions. First, the gentleman there, and then directly behind, there's a lady in blue, I think. We'll Thank you so much, uh, 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 Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Zhang. Uh, uh, I have two questions. First, it is about the uh, Article 15 of the uh, Protocol on the acc uh, Accession of the PRC. Uh, as we all know that uh, uh, 
this uh, this article has been used uh, uh, for uh, for those non market uh, market country, and it should be terminated. I think it's in in about two weeks. In next two weeks, I think this um, this article you know, uh, well logically should be terminated. But however, there's another voice said that this. Uh, the Article 15 uh, will still keep uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to restrict the China, Chinese uh, economy, something like that. And uh, during the past, uh, past uh, decades, uh, this article has been used to, as a weapon to, uh, to uh, restrict, uh, restrict China's economy by, uh, by antitrust and uh, anti-dumping. So I'd like to know uh, your opinion uh, about the about the future, about the next two weeks, will this, will this Article 15 uh, will, be, uh, will be terminated and what will happen? And second question is about the UK. Uh, as we all know that uh, the UK is a, is a country which, uh, which joined the uh, WTO as a membership of European Union. So as now, uh, the Euro, uh, UK is, uh, seems like they, they, they are not, uh, well, a country of, they were not, uh, well, maybe, uh, uh, largely, maybe uh, there will not be a country of European Union. So after that, uh, so what will uh, your opinion about whether UK, uh, the relationship between UK and the WTO, will it still be kept in WTO? Or not? Thank you so much. And let's okay. just let's just ask the lady at the back, and then we've got three questions to answer, and you can you can decide how you're going to balance the. Uh... Uh, thank you, Professor Sands. Um, good evening, uh, uh, Jiang, Professor Zhang. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting. Uh, insight into the WTO trade disputes settlement. Um, it's Jujing Lu from Bo and Leighton Paisner, by the way. Um, I do international commercial arbitration um, and some investment treaty work um, under the um, exit, um, the auspices of the exit um, uh, center. And I, uh, you spoke earlier um, about um, one of your 10-point proposals uh, relate to the um, importance and also the benefits that you see um, could be derived from um, ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution. Um, and you mentioned uh, processes such as um, mediation and conciliation. And I just wondered, it's something that I come across quite often uh, in what I do. And I just wondered whether um, what your view is um, and what you think the, the, the forms of ADR you propose uh, might differ from the uh, traditional ADR uh, procedures that we see, for example, are you uh, minded to propose that um, that uh, the ADR, in, in specifically um, mediation, are likely to be carried out in the under the auspices of the of the WTO, or are you likely to suggest that uh, it should be conducted by third parties? Um, and uh, moreover, are you are you minded to say that uh, ADR should be should should really act as a pre a requisite or, pre or, or, or a condition precedent uh, to commencing formal proceedings through, uh, for example, the panel stage or even, the, even through to the appellate body? Or is it just likely to be a, um, a, a, some sort of an encouragement that parties should take up ADR before uh, they proceed uh, with the formal dispute resolution uh, processes? So be very grateful for your views. Thank you. Okay. For your first question, Article 15 of China's accession protocol, uh, I would think that uh, some confusion for that. Uh, the non-market economy uh, in the WTO, so there's no such definition of non-market economy. It's a, in the anti-damping procedures, it's a, a calculation methodology whether they use a, a third country, analog country, or a comparable country prices. Uh, the norm, normal requirement is to use the, the country of origin, uh, the cost because the other, the third country is, uh, is not comparable. The key issue of anti-dumping is to get uh, the accurate calculation of dumping margin. And your imposition of dumping duty shall not higher than the dumping margin. 
So that's the lesser duty rule. It's not to determine a country's uh, economy. That's the country's uh, sovereign rights. They can decide uh, which uh, model they follow. Based on the, the, the word of the, because when we, we read the uh, accession protocol, we have to use the Vienna Convention. The text, context, object, purpose. So if you see, to me, as uh, a loyal background, shall terminate. Shall is a legal obligation. That's for your first question. Your second question, uh, I, for the UK, I'm not uh, in the position <laughs> to, uh, to comment on that. I just outlined the possibility. I don't think that the, the UK wants to leave the WTO. So no country uh, uh, is doing that. But they have, so if we think the EU to join the WTO, they can also negotiate the terms to join separately, or that that's possible, this possible according to the WTO agreement. And the, the third question with regard to ADR, Certainly, I do propose for the WTO because the jurisdiction of the WTO is uh, very special to dealing with government to government uh, issues. So I see the, the needs for that. Uh, for others, I, my personal experience and observation for commercial uh, arbitration or a local courts, they all, always use the ADR, one way or an another, before the formal proceeding or in the middle of the proceeding. Because still, the party's autonomy is the guiding principle. If parties, they can reach an agreement, no third party can force them to go to one way, not the other. Can I, I just want to follow up on one point on the UK position. I don't want to push you into saying anything you don't want to say, but just your experience, you were Director General of the Ministry of Trade. You have experience of observing at least China's move to join the WTO. This was not a fast process. What's your sense of how quickly country in the position of the United Kingdom can transition out of one membership into another membership. Do you think that's relatively straightforward, or do you think it could be more complex? Uh, I, I would say that in the UK case, since uh, already part of the WTO, but uh, under another title, the conditions and terms and conditions still are the same should be easier than a, a brand new member to join. Because uh, overall, the, the WTO is a contractual arrangement. It's a balance of rights and obligations. So for a new member, they have to negotiate for every member to determine the balance uh, of their rights and obligations. But the UK already existing Part. I don't see existing member because the, the legal title is different. So I would say in that sense, the, the rights and obligations, no much change. Maybe just a procedure, but you, you still have to negotiate. Let's take the lady there and then the gentleman behind you, and I'll try to get around. Let's get a couple of quick questions. Let's get them as quickly as there's a lot of people with hands up. Don't say. Thank you very much for your informative lecture. Um, I have a question. In terms of your proposed reforms, you spoke at length about the use of um, ADR as being an alternative channel through which international trade disputes can be resolved. Um, what role do you see technology in its broad sense um, playing in 
effectively enhancing the um, well, the, the power that these um, that the ADRs can have in um, addressing disputes and allowing them to effectively um, well achieve their objectives and allowing them to function effectively. If you can pass the microphone to the gentleman behind you, let's get him and then we'll get a third question at the front and then we'll have your three. Yeah. I've got a question for the professor, but I just want to continue. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have a two-base condition for the coming 10 years. We do not need to be then formed and then the rest of the world. We go ahead and talk. Oh, well, I'm just going to give this gentleman at the front, and then we'll come around to that side of the room. Yes. Uh, Madam, thank you so much uh, for making your time to come and uh, address us. I just have uh, two quick questions. One is uh, the WTO. How do you, you're doing a good job. How do you tell your stories? That is one. The second one is with the price of our commodities now, oil prices are down. What would be your advice to the governments in Africa on how they can be able to attract investors to come and invest in the countries, taking a very strong view about what's going on in Nigeria to help to create jobs and also to reduce poverty? Thank you. Let's take answers to these questions and then we'll have another round. Okay. Uh, for your question, the, the reform proposals, including the page limit or others, uh, some of them, they, they can make it not, uh, they don't need to go to the, the trade ministerial conference. They just like uh, the working procedure, they can modify. But the question is, uh, if they ask a party to do that, then, uh, you know, some uh, uh, members, they, they are reluctant to accept. So initial stage, they should be very uh, flexible. It means uh, they have a, a maximum page limit or something, and then to gradually to be more strict. Because if they, they impose very strict the rule, it's very difficult to be appreciated by so many members. With regard to your question to African members, I have full sympathy because I have been working with the Western African Development Bank. So I see that Africa has big potential for, for the development, but still the poverty is, is a problem. I, I do call the WTO to provide more assistance, and the aid for trade is crucial. For those multilateral development banks, they should mobilize more financial resources and support. Because for members uh, of uh, uh, Africa or some other poor uh, countries, to set up uh, an office in Geneva is too expensive. So I, I would think that's why I propose that they should open their uh, oral hearings through internet and then countries you know, in Africa, they can have their uh, uh, professors or trade experts, they can follow those proceedings or cases. But the training is, is the key. So I always uh, encourage, emphasize on local capacity building. Human resources are the most important for the world trade competition. Uh, so that's why I see so many, you know, uh, younger uh, scholars together with those experienced professors. So you have a bright future. 
goes this side of the room over here, and then down at the front over here, and then at the back. Three more questions. Thank you very much, Judge Eng, for the presentation. Uh, there are two competing narratives in vogue in academia on the success of the WTO dispute settlement. The first one is that the applied body was able to main, main, re, affirm and maintain its independence and in face of pressure from powerful members. The second one would be that the system was able to survive because it could accommodate the members' interests in, to, to, to a certain extent. Which would be your personal take on that issue, considering, for example, uh, recent developments on the non-reappointment uh, of a member of the appellate body uh, by the action of the United States. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's just come to the front over here, down to the front, and then in pink at the back. Thank you. You talked about the importance of having judges from different parts of the world on the appellate body with, with different legal backgrounds. I wondered whether you were able to describe any examples, any actual occasions on which a difference of national approach became apparent. I mean, and I am obviously particularly interested in whether you think there is a, whether you'd say there was a particularly Chinese approach to at least this area of international law. And one third one up and back. First of all, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to listen to you. Uh, my question is, again, with reference to the recent developments with regards to the US reservations on the reappointment of one of the appellate body members. So in that line, my question is regarding Can you just judicial speak a bit independence. Closer to the, a bit closer to the microphone. Okay. So my question is about judicial independence, and I would want to know your response on when some of the states say that there should be a limitation on judicial independence as judges go way too far with that and turn it into judicial activism. So how would you respond to this? So three questions about judges. Okay. Uh, <laughs> with regard to oh, the judges' qualification, independence, impartiality uh, are crucial. Uh, to make an objective decision. So I think uh, uh, it's not only for the authority or dignity of the appellate body, but also for the judges uh, yourself. We are co protecting our credibility. So that's very important. So during, that's why during the, the eight years functions, always voiceless and faceless. I never have expert communication or contact the government, and the Chinese government ne never intervened in my uh, uh, the decision or function of the cases. Uh, it's a quality. You, you have to do this, because you know, you're how can I have the trust by other people. Uh, with regard, you mentioned the reappointment issue. Uh, you know already that our current uh, members and the former members, they wrote a letter. We criticized the way to link the outcome of a particular case to the reappointment of the, a government decision. It's wrong because you have to, uh, the independence, you Everybody has to protect the system. So if you a member, so you want to, lead, to, to, to pressure the judges to render only the cases please you, it's wrong. In any legal system, it's wrong. But, uh, can I just say that, that, I mean, that was a very courageous thing for a group of judges to do. How much reflection went into the issue of whether to jointly write that letter? Was that, that must have been something you thought about very carefully before deciding to do it. Yeah, in the letter, clearly indicate, we said that members have the right to appointment and the reappointment. We respect. 
we do not agree only the way, particularly publicly, to link an outcome of a case to a, a reappointment. So I would say that's right. That's right. Yeah. If if they they do not do that to have a press release or publicly to point to a particular judge, well, we we would not uh, write that. Because you wouldn't know about it. No. Oh no. They, yeah. I mean. <laughs> yeah. It's maybe, but. But the question is, I think the culture, the the independence, impartiality, and to protect judicial independence. So everybody, uh, we always talk about uh, global governance and economic uh, uh, governance, the rule of law, and respect to the independence, the impartiality of that is very important. Uh, with regard to your question, I I don't think that uh, you know because as a Chinese uh, we have a, a special different view with regard to public international law. Uh, what uh, with a different background, what we can bring is to uh, for same measure, whether it's consistent with a, a particular provision, maybe we have different views. Because uh, as I have been to Africa, I have been to, to Asian Development Bank, I know many poor uh, countries. I know why the government took that measure. So then, when, when we have different views, certainly, first we, we, we observe and respect the rules. And then, to measure when the measure itself is consistent with the rules, it's rather to the efforts to seek the truth, the, the, the real intention of the decision makers or the rules itself. So, uh, so that's in most uh, of the cases, our exchange of views, the debates, sometimes very sharp, very difficult, very different, uh, different views. Uh, but, uh, you know, gradually, we we'll listen to each other. Once it's, uh, th this view is, uh, closer to the truth, then we can make a better conclusion. That's why I appreciate the diversity of background. And there is one more that we, which we sort of addressed, but the, the lady in, in pink also, you had asked your question. Are you happy yours has been addressed? Okay, very good. Um, I think we now, you're pointing at something. Oh, sorry, where, where is that? Far corner? Oh, my word, sorry, I, I should turn my body around. And I didn't, I'm so sorry, I didn't see you up there. Not really. Hi, three very quick points. Uh, the Trading with Enemy Act of 1917, I don't know if you've, Mr. Sands, QC, has heard of that one, which America can withhold trade from enemy states. Second, China starts with the WTO and now Cuba and the relaxation of US laws with regards to Cuba. And also, Tsang Su said, you can kill a thousand enemies, but you will kill 800 of your own soldiers. Is that something China will adopt as a policy with regards to Mr. Trump? <laughs> I, um, you translated the question. I mean... <laughs> I could try, but it would probably take quite a long time. Um, um, I mean, uh, trading with the enemy, I think we can't ask Judge Zhang to get into that such a particular thing. The other two issues, I mean, um, I mean I'll mean, i just paraphrase your, your, your last question, if I may. I mean, where does China go now? 
in the face, or you personally, what's your observation as to where the system goes now, in the face of an imminent situation where we appear to have a new US president who is less committed to multilateral free trade. TPP is dead, he says TTIP is dead, various other things are dead. He favors apparently bilateral trade agreements. Um, what, I mean, I've paraphrased a bit, but what is your sense of China's position against that background? What, what is the likely future direction? <laughs> Still, I'm <laughs> not uh, in the position to comment on a particular bilater uh, bilateral relationship between the two important uh, biggest uh, countries. I, I would be a little bit open than I used to be. Uh, I would say that my personal observation each time before or immediately after the presidential, uh, present election in the US. They always take uh, China as a target, as an enemy. But afterwards, then they realize the importance of the relationship between two countries. So the, at least the atmosphere is, uh, is, is getting you know, soften a little bit uh, because the, the the current uh, still relationship, trade re relationship, interdependent to each other. If they want to create uh, jobs for their own nationals, they have to keep uh, the trade going on. They, they are favor show that 30% uh, of the, the jobs created by the bilateral trade. So I don't think that, uh, I, I have no such uh, worry. I trust that uh, the political leaders of two countries, they need to you know, manage carefully to reduce the tension and to, to keep the, the peace and development going on, particularly the bilateral trade relations uh, continue to develop. With regard to multilateral uh, uh, system, as I mentioned, I strongly believe the multilateral trading system, will, such as WTO, will never die. So it means that I don't see that the U.S. has the interest to leave the WTO because they want to use the WTO dispute settlement to settle their dispute with the other members. So even for their own interest, they will not leave the WTO. Thank you so much for that openness. I think we've reached, I'm afraid, the end time. I think you can see from the hands we could go on and on and on. You've been really remarkably generous in taking this range of questions and with sharing your observations uh, with us tonight. So on behalf of Dave McKenzie and University College London and everyone who's here this evening, can I thank you very warmly for being with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you.